in the mother the house. Death Row can be bigger than Motown or Sony or Warner Brothers. Death Row is going to be the biggest record company there is. The master plan was to take over the world. All of the greatest artists came together at one time, and it was like a comet streaking across the sky. Sex, drugs, violence. For better or for worse, gangbanging went pop. It's like everything we touched turned to gold. Next year, Death Row gonna start printing our own money. If you wanted a car, two cars, five cars, you could have it. The very first year, I generated $150 million. Death Row parties were super bananas. Like, this shit can't be real. The more money we made and the bigger that we got, it became more dangerous. It was just a blood nation. Shook spooked me. I'm telling you, I didn't want to be around him. They want the drama. We're going to definitely bring it like only Death Row could bring it. That's when I knew this is more than just music. This is dangerous. When Pog died, I'm going to get the f out of here. I know who killed Tupac Shakur. The last living eyewitness to Tupac's murder is telling his story. Legacy of Death Row could have been bigger than Jesus, but they crucified themselves. Suge Knight is the heart and soul of Death Row Records. To be able to understand the label, you have to understand who he is. Snoop, Tupac, Dre were in charge of the music, but Suge was the force to be reckoned with. He put Death Row Records on the map. How does it feel to be so feared? I don't look at it as fear, I look at it as respect. Suge Knight is a mythical figure. The controversial CEO of Death Row Records. The most feared figure in all of hip hop. His size was intimidating. Knight had been on probation for a 1992 assault on two aspiring rappers. He's a beast, he was a bully. Suge Knight, how you doing? Don't kill me. All right, now. I'm talking about slap men hard. I'm talking about an open fist across their face. Police in Los Angeles charging Knight with assault and battery. Suge was affiliated with Bloods. Suge was involved in guns. Suge was involved in drugs. Suge was involved in, uh, he was a half-assed pimp. Suge Knight goes back to jail. This is like some Godfather type stuff. The music producer is accused of running down two men and killing them in a Los Angeles parking lot. This call is being recorded. The sick director straight is like this. I'm not a monster. I'm not this really bad person who don't care about nobody. I mean, I care about my artists. I'm gonna treat them like family. It ain't just about me. At one time, I had 500 employees, and everybody was in the ghettos. To be able to get people that come from nothing to give them something. That was the most important thing to me. The perception that people have of Suge Today's Suge is a lot different than the Suge I met years ago. People believe Suge was a gangster, but Suge Knight did not grow up as a gangster. Suge Knight grew up in the middle of Compton in a lower middle class neighborhood with working class parents. I met Suge at a party. I was probably about 14. We were about three years apart. He kind of followed me the whole time and wouldn't let me dance with anybody else. I either was going to date him or date nobody. That's how he felt. His parents, they were very family oriented. And in that neighborhood, most black families didn't have a mother and father in the same house. Part you got to understand something. Compton was the best place in the world to grow up in. Amazing place. I mean, people kept their grass cut, people kept their cars clean. And next thing you know, you're seeing people with no lights, no food, and people walking around 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, on crack. If you're a young black guy, Growing up in Compton at that time, I mean, drugs and gangs were 
as much a part of your life as stoplights and street signs. Suge's never been in a gang, but Compton was blood. And growing up back then, you were associated with whatever color was in your neighborhood. I grew up fast, like hands on. You had to tell them where you from and you handle your business. You had to know how to fight. My uncles and my father, they were never gangbangers, but pretty much taught me the streets. They was hard on me, but it was definitely aggressive living. And sports was your, was your getaway. Played uh, Pop Warner football at Greater Compton, which uh, I knew him since he was a kid. And then we lost contact. I fell in with gangs. Sugar was a good kid. Went to college. That's what good kids do, go to college. Well, we're ready to get it underway. We couldn't have asked for a more perfect afternoon for a college football game, could we? He was a good football player. Should have got his sacks in there. Sets up. Now he's going to run it up the middle. 45 and dives near the 48-yard line. I love to play the game. I had to give myself bets how many dudes I was going to hurt. I did enjoy the contact. I, I did enjoy hitting. Here's the snap. He drops back on the draw, but he runs into a lineman right at the 40-yard line and falls forward to the 41. And the tackle made by Marion Knight, a 6'2", 260-pound senior. He was a leader on the team, and guys respected him. Last year, we was that close to winning. We, did, we, we, just, we just dedicated to ourselves and to our fans, and went out and worked as hard as we could to win it. We knew we could beat him all the time. He was one of those uh, defensive linemen that was, that was pretty, he was pretty aggressive. His whole mentality years later in the record business all came from playing football. You know, I'm going to go out and get this one way or the other. Sports was a major part of my life for its discipline. And sports teach you how to respect people, and they get respect. Sports also taught you that if somebody's trying to knock you down, you knock them down. There was a time where I was having an issue with a guy at, at the school. I casually mentioned it to Shug, and he, he asked me, did I need, I need any help? So I was, I was thinking about it. I said, yeah, I probably could use some help. And then you know, he raised his shirt, and you know, I actually saw a butt of a gun. And so I said, oh, no, 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 not that, no, I'm good. In Vegas, Suge started showing a behavior uh, that was violent. He thought that I was with some man. One day, my car stopped on me, and Suge put sugar down my gas tank. He denies it, but he did it. I come to get my car back. All the windows busted out of it. One time, he pulled my ponytail down to his lap and reached behind the seat, and all I could hear is this crunch, crunch, crunch. I'm like, did you just really cut my hair? He didn't want nobody else to like me. And he thought that since he liked my hair, that if it was gone, nobody else would like me either. Why I got married to this man, I don't know. But why not? I loved him, he loved me. Why not be with this man? He didn't come up being a gangbanger, but he glorified it. And I think if you talk to most people who really had a street life, they spent most of their time trying to get out of the street. Suge spent a lot of his time trying to get in the streets. Gang life leaked into this pro sports aspirations and it wound up killing it. He was a senior. Football season was coming to an end. He had an offer with the 49ers and he ran into a problem. Ricky Crockett, a friend of Suge Knight's, he's in Las Vegas. There's a dispute that happens. They have a confrontation that gets so heated that Suge pulls out a gun and shoots him. I get a phone call, and he said he shot his friend. And I'm like, you did what? It's not a life-threatening injury, thankfully. It's his friend who refuses to cooperate with the police. He got a slap on the wrist for it. He was put on probation for, I think he had like five-year probation for that. He lost that contract with the 49ers because they didn't want to deal with the violence. They dropped him. Football told you, and my father told me, that you never quit. If you get hit, you get back up. Growing up in Compton, you was against the odds every day. I couldn't keep playing football, but I knew what direction I wanted to go. I chose to be my own boss and get into the music.
After the incident in Vegas, the 49ers took back their offer. So Suge and I moved back to California. And at that time, Compton was crazy. The police arrested these people, ages 15 through 30, for selling rock cocaine. In the 80s, Los Angeles was, was weird in that it was very segregated. You had a group of white cops who were patrolling black neighborhoods, and it was a lot of distrust because of crack. You have police brutality on Monday, police brutality on Tuesday, police brutality on Thursday. Police brutality on Saturday was an ongoing condition. You had a generation, man, that they were fed up. Cops pissing in your face and telling you it's raining. And it's like, that ain't rain. Hip hop really is almost like a response to the failures of police in LA. You know what I mean? It's our soundtrack. You know, it's what Chuck D called Black America CNN. These guys who have gone through this every day didn't have a voice. But now you have somebody that can speak for you. And that was N.W.A. The police coming straight from the underground. A young got it back because I'm brown. Young black males is a target right now. It's open season. It ain't rabbit season or duck season. It's young black males season. That's what it is right now. Everybody in the ghetto was starving. The streets were starving. So when rap came along, that was a new drug, but it was legal. When we started NWA, it was just to sell a few records out of the trunk and make some money. We didn't start hip hop music, we just got it popular. That's the way it goes in the city of Compton, boy. Suge had a lot of friends from Compton and elsewhere who were getting involved in the rap business. And he said, okay, well, you know, maybe I can make money in that business. Bobby. He meets Bobby Brown at an after party. He kept Bobby Brown from getting like hit by a crazy fan, and from there, boom, he's Bobby's bodyguard. Bobby Brown wanted to go on tour, on my prerogative tour. But he owes him guys some money and they had a um, contract on Bobby. They was out to they was out to kill Bobby. So that we're not gonna be able to tour because Bobby's scared of these guys trying to kill him. So I confronted the guys, I dealt with the guys, and I was aggressive. It made that guy apologize to Bobby. So the word traveled around that you know I was a stand-up guy. I think along the way he was being taught all about the music industry, and he was fascinated. They took me on tour, and I learned on tour how every person who's writing songs is getting beat out their money, like they published. In the late 80s, he started managing. Eventually, he managed Jodeci, Mary J. Blige, DLC, but Chocolate was his first success story. That began everything. I went with Suge to be my manager because he really want to see me win. Mario Chocolate Johnson, he wrote some of the lyrics on Ice Ice Baby for Vanilla Ice. It wasn't until they were getting awards and when Chocolate goes, hey, I worked on that. Chart-topping rapper Vanilla Ice, his debut single, Ice Ice Baby, went to number one this week. My record was selling over a million copies a week. Fastest selling record in history. Double platinum, platinum, kept going up. I was like, oh my God. If there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out the hook when my DJ revolves it. When Alice's attorneys, they tried to give me a contract for ghostwriting for 100000 And I was going to take it, because I didn't know. You know, 100000 to a man from the ghetto sounds good. And Suge got a whiff of what they were doing. Said, no, you ain't signing this as a ghostwriter. All right, stop. I tell you, you don't have nothing to worry about. This is worth a lot of money. I didn't start off want to have a record label. I started off wanting to give artists to make sure they get decent record deals. You know, I want to make sure they get their publishing. I'm going to make sure they get their due. Suge saw in that an opportunity. The more intimidating he seemed, the more mythical he became. And that Vanilla Ice story became an instant urban legend. And roll. Death Row Chronicles, scene four, take one. 
According to Vanilla Ice, Suge started showing up wherever Vanilla Ice was along with a group of huge bodyguards, and Vanilla said they were bigger than his bodyguards. The next time Suge shows up without any warning, just to let Vanilla Ice know he's got that control. Wow, this guy knows where I'm at at all times. How does he know where I'm at? You know, what's going on here? Vanilla Ice had security, and they wanted to get aggressive, and I was aggressive. They security to me looked like Tarzan, but acting like Jane. Suge took Vanilla Ice out to the balcony. He had me look over the edge. Show me how high I was up there. When I said that Suge hung him over the banister. I needed to wear a diaper on that day. <laughs> Suge got a paper written up and made by Ellen Ice sign that paper. If you don't sign, you're going to woo the woo. Sign him. Walked away alive. That never happened. Take two. The most threatening thing of that whole night that Suge said was, we could be here for 15 minutes, or we could be here all night. It wasn't not one shove, push, no disrespect or nothing. So once I explained to him it was flat out still and flat out robbery, and we're not going for it, they all did the right thing. I'm there, so I know. Kill all of that urban legend never happened. I can recall talking to Suge and said, you know, why don't you clean that story up so that people don't think you are a gangster? And really, I think he enjoyed people thinking he was a gangster because it added to his reputation. Vanilla Ice saying that he got hung over a, a balcony, it changed Suge's life drastically because it put him in that door. And all of a sudden, people who would not return his phone calls start returning his phone calls. <laughs> I wanted that to be known that I care about my artists, and I was going to make sure they get their justice. Suge knew what he was doing. Suge already had a blueprint for where he was going and what he wanted to do, and that was to bully the game. He had a plan. His plan was to take over hip hop. It's Easy E and NWA, and we cooling out here at this party, right? <laughs> Having a ball. Big <laughs> in the house. Know that. My father started off being a janitor at UCLA and worked his way up to being a truck driver. My father was one of the hardest working men I've ever been in my life. But my father didn't have two pennies to run together. You can work all your life and get a little bit of money, or you can be a businessman, an entrepreneur, and be your own boss. I said, look, man, I'm going to go do this music thing. Suge had a vision to become something bigger than he was, and he saw Dre as his way to do that. Yo, my name is Dr. Dre. I do most of the music for NWA. I like Produce, so you know. Between 1987, when Ruthless Records was incorporated, through 1991, Dr. Dre had produced about 15 million in album sales. NWA's album blasted its way to number one on the album charts. I'm expressing with my full capabilities And now I'm living in correctional facilities Cause some don't agree with how I do this I get straight and meditate like a Buddhist Dre's genius came from the ability to recognize a good beat It's Dre on the mic getting physical Doing a job at WA is the lynch mob I'm the type of person I can get anybody in the studio to make a hit record off of them If they have any kind of talent, I can pull it out of them I'm digging that shit Drake, he knows when some shit is hot. He hears some shit, and he tell you it's fire. It'll burn the shit out of you if you touch it. Dre, he was hot. But he was unhappy with Ruthless Records. You can ask any artist on Ruthless Records if they're happy. I bet you they say no. <laughs> I'm the general manager of Ruthless Records. I'm Easy es personal manager. As Easy es started to expand into different areas of the business, I found my uh, duties becoming more diversified. When they first put the whole Ruthless thing together, Easy was going to put the money up, Dre was going to make the beats. They were going to be partners. As time went on, 
and the, the pie got bigger. Jerry stepped in and pulled Eric to the side and was like, look, man, you can be partners, you don't need Dre, and they left Dre as an employee. He wasn't getting paid what we were supposed to, and I'm the type of person I don't want no more, no less than what I'm supposed to get. If I can't have that, I can't, I can't be around you. The mega. The mega. Michelle. And Trey, tell us a little bit about what else is coming up for Michelle. Well, I gotta tell you, she got the super hype album coming out entitled <coughs> Michelle, of course. And her gimmick is the way she talks. Say hi. 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 Say hi. When I was dating Dre, I was actually signed with Ruthless. But at the time, Dre and I, we struggled. We struggled like you're supposed to for a while there, but he, he told me don't worry yet. I didn't. Only thing I want to do is live my life, make my money, make the money I'm supposed to make. Dre and Doc, they were broke. I mean, uh, even the little money they got was a, a lot. I mean, Dre had a mansion in Calabasas that was empty, like devoid of furniture. Like, you know, if there was a fire, it would go out because there was nothing to burn. One thing Suge was always smart about was he aligned himself with a big star. In every move he made, you can see it. Bobby Brown, DOC. Suge wanted to start a label with DOC, and DOC thought this was a good idea at first, but they both ultimately realized that they needed Dr. Dre. And so in 1991, they set their sights on trying to convince Dr. Dre to come with them. Shook has started really finessing Dre when we were still with Ruthless. He was really plotting. He was seeing us before we were seeing him. He, he, he may be an idiot, but he's not stupid. I worked at Ruthless and Jerry Heller, who's my cousin, and uh, Suge started coming to the studio where we were recording. The next thing we know, um, Dre is speaking to Easy Less and going to the studio less, spending more time with Suge. I would question everything from, why does he show up everywhere that we're at? You know, Easy and Dre have these beautiful pool parties, and Suge would be around. Why is he at the videos? He was just kind of always in the background. Suge spooked me, I'm telling you, I didn't want to be around him. Dre wanted me to go through his contracts. So I went and talked to Jerry and I said, listen, anything he signs, he entitled to have a copy of it. They kept telling Dre he cannot get his contract. Suge and some of his guys went to Ruthless Records' lawyer's office with ball bats and demanded the contracts. Dre's contract, Michelet's contract, DLC's contract. And, and terrified this guy. The guy peed his pants. He was a big time lawyer, but he got totally gangster. Sure came to our home and had a meeting with Dre, and he told him that we were getting like two cents on every record, like two pennies. And Dre was furious. Check my contracts out, sure enough wasn't worth the paper they were written on, you know? And um, that was that for me. So I said, Dre, look, ain't no use of going back over spilled milk. I got a vision. Obviously, you got a vision. Let's just start fresh. Shook, he was aggressive, and he really seemed like a go-getter to me. You know what I'm saying? And he was making things happen. That's all I really cared about, was getting in the studio making music. If you're gonna help me with that, so be it. Let's keep it moving. Suge broke the, he broke the, the chains. His unorthodox way of getting a deal was groundbreaking. How did Suge go from being a bodyguard to running his own label? It's called a street, a street instinct. He never went for the little man, he always went for the big guy. You don't rob the person who's who's selling the dope on the street. You rob the person who's who has the dope. Dre called Easy and said, "Look, man, let's squash this. Meet me at the studio. Just me and you. We'll talk it over, you know, and and figure this out." Yes. 
Death Row Chronicles in 2 out take 7, Mark. Easy e shows up to this office within the studio that is soundproof. Hey, what's going on? Hey, where's Dre at? A beatdown ensues. Hey. Even after that beatdown, Easy e is tough. Easy e is grew up in Compton. He's a real dude like from that? the streets. He still won't sign them because he knows what he's giving up. Suge allegedly hands him a piece of paper without saying anything else about what's on it and says, this is where we're going next if you don't sign it and it's Easy es mother's address in the suburbs, wherever he'd moved her. That terrified him, and as Jerry Heller later said, under severe psychological duress, he signs the releases. Suge was one of us. He wasn't no CEO, he wasn't no, no tie behind no desk. He was a thug just like everybody else. Gangsterism ain't even a word, but I'm gonna say that right now. He took gangsterism to a different level. If you're not getting treated right in a place, you're not gonna stay there, you know? That's all that was. I guess they didn't respect my talent. <laughs> you know? So now they're suffering the consequences. Suge Knight extricates Dr. Dre and DOC from their contracts with Ruthless Records. And I really don't give a what you need. Suge knew that getting easy to sign that paper was his shot. He knew it. He knew he was like, he had this marquee talent, Dr. Dre, and his main ghostwriter in DOC. He knew it was his shot, and he was gonna go in there by any means necessary and get, to get it done. And it sent the word out that Suge was not someone to be toyed with. Suge tried to destroy my record company with the help of others, Dre. So right now we're getting everything back together and we finna come out, you know, fully loaded. Easy was pissed off at Suge for taking Dre. It was much money and energy and work that Easy put into starting Ruthless and making a success, you know, like that. It was, you know, kind of gone. Easy wanted to kill Suge himself. He just wanted to kill Suge. And Jerry talked him out of it. That beef drew very severe lines, way beyond LL and Cool Mo D and all the old school 80s, you know, battle raps. For the first time, the beef created an environment which was dangerous, and I think it was rooted partly in some gang shit. It was always the gang undertone because of the easy crip affiliation and sure of blood affiliation. And I'm sitting there going, wow, this is really some crazy shit. I think the guy is a, is a serious, major gangster. Jerry was, well, he was freaked out. Jerry's response was to hire an ex-Israeli Special Forces dude named Klein, who uh, helped organize a defense against Suge and his guys. Mike Klein was a very tough, hard, badass guy. Let's say that I'm proficient in self-defense and, and uh, that kind of stuff. The story I heard was Klein told Suge he was gonna cut him up in little pieces and put him in dumpsters all around the city. That's a myth. All I can tell you is we reached an understanding that nobody was coming to the office without an appointment. I have guns all around this house. You know, the, this art form isn't worth me and my family getting killed over. Everyone had guns. We had shotguns in the corner. We had Uzis. Our secretaries had guns. I didn't look at how dangerous it was. I thought it was gangster hell. It was like the movies. It was like a modern day um, Scarface. Easy E it took me into the bedroom in Norwalk, opened up the closet, and there were automatic weapons on a shelf. And you gotta ask yourself, why are you, why are you showing a reporter, your guns. You know that there's a chance I'm going back to the source and I'm gonna write about this. So either you're hoping I write about this or you're hoping that I won't write about this but I'll put out the word that, that you got guns and you're ready for battle. Izzy was not the type of guy that would take a beating and not respond in some way. That I can assure you. Izzy was small in stature but a lot in guts. 
Suge told Easy, if you don't sign these papers, we're gonna beat you to a pulp. You know, it was, it was extortion. Ruthless filed a lawsuit to rescind the releases and to get damages for the loss of Dre's recording services. Only way I controlled everybody getting great deals and getting taken care of and getting the opportunity is to start a record label. But at the same time, I still have to give a lot of credit to a guy named Dick Griffey who owns Solar Records. Dick Griffey started mentoring Shook a lot for the business of how to be in the record industry and how to own your own record label. So that's how it started. The Solar Office Building. We had a studio. We had a rehearsal room. We had some writers' rooms and other things. I was the president of Solar Records. We agreed to let Shug move Doc and Dre and kind of all the all the folks who were going to make up Death Row Records into the third floor where they could start recording and make, making records. As far as I could tell, the guys seemed to have no money. I mean, literally, there were times when Dick and I would pay the lease payments on Shook's car. What people don't realize is we had some financial struggles. I had other jobs, so that's what carried us that people don't know. I worked, and I was having a baby at the time. So it was tough. Are you ready? Hi, my name is David Kenner, and I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the attorney for Death Row and uh, its artists and principals. David Kenner was a criminal attorney. He did a lot of, like, mafia cases and big drug dealer cases and all that stuff. They reach a point where they need a financial partner. Through an, his attorney, David Kenner, Suge is put in touch with Michael Harris, AKA Harry O. Michael Harris was a major drug dealer, not the kind that, you know, I got dimes. No, he's the guy that would deal directly with Noriega. And he was in prison at the time. This call is from a federal prison. I sold drugs at an early age as a youngster. I sold it as an avenue to get out of a community that I felt that didn't have a lot of opportunities. Kenner brought Shirley in to see me uh, due to my request after being told that uh, Shug was involved with uh, Dr. Dre. Shug was introduced to Harry O. They had their meetings at the prison uh, where he was being held. He got the funding in a prison visiting room. It doesn't get more gangster than that. We decided to, to set up a company. I put up, you know, a $1.5 million investment. Till I brought Death Row into the equation. On paper, as a company, there was no death row. I actually set up GF Entertainment as a parent company and made death row a subsidiary. And so there was 100% ownership through my trust. The name death row, who came up yes, with it? I did. Over the years, a lot of people started saying, oh, I started, I started, but no. I started it because of my situation. I feel in the future, death row can be um, a Sony or Atlantic or Warner Brothers. But the first step, you know, you gotta get people to know Death Row. Michael Harris said, we gotta do this big. You know, we got to put Death Row on the map. And he said, we gotta do Chasen's. Chasen's was a swanky Beverly Hills restaurant. Let me see somebody give Trey, should the DOC a round of applause. Death Row Records is going to be the record company of the 2000s. Put your hands together. Come on, y'all, make some noise. I remember Shug's mom and dad were there, and a lot of the people from the hood are sitting in Chasen's. Hey, we're in Beverly Hills, you know, most of whom had never left the hood. They invited sort of a who's who of the industry. And we decided we would actually do the uh, invitations in a subpoena form. You know, it's kind of like an inside joke based on my situation. That's where I was going to be big, huge. We have the best acts coming out. Oh, not we. Look at me. Like, it's my label, really? This is that Row. Really? It was like a dream to have a black-owned label. Like, what is a black-owned label? It just didn't exist before it should. And Dre. Is that the future shot? Hell no, it's Death Row. Right. I was all in because in the beginning, they would say, yo, we all gonna win. Death Row is gonna be the label of the future. 
Death Row is an artist label where the artist is always right in a situation where we give a home and have open arms to artists. The Sugar Master plan was to have the most talented roster of artists and to become the biggest record label on the planet. The most powerful record label to come out into the market that I've ever seen in my life, and I mean that. Death Row, Death Row, Death Row. That's what's happening tonight. DLC, come up with the B-O-M-B, Yes. Death Row Records. The label started with uh, Dr. Dre, who was gonna do his own thing, and uh, with a lot of help from Suge Knight and uh, Harry O and a number of people, and we got it all together. After the party at Chasen's announcing the founding of Death Row Records, now they're officially set up in business. And within the week of the Harry O deal being made, red carpet gets rolled out. Dre was able to come in with a wish list of equipment. They got, you know, like a new vocal booth. They got upgrades on the microphones. Tell me what, you got like 48 tracks and stuff now? 56 tracks. Just an infusion of capital they desperately needed that Harry O provided without any question. Harry O was still behind bars when he was helping Suge get this label off the ground. And so he and Suge talked almost every day. I was actually brought in as the chief engineer for Solar Records. One day I'm in the studio and I'm actually repairing something. Harry O calls and I answer the phone. And I said, I got to run out and get some parts. And he goes, well, how much is that? And I said, it's going to be about a grand. I said, I got it. He said, no, 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 no. Let me call you back. About 20 minutes later, this guy comes up and hands me a bag. And it's got about 30 grand. And I said, but I only needed 1,000. There was a time that I got $100,000 and there wasn't a bill bigger than a 20. <laughs> Death Row was never really organized. For example, making sure we had an accounting department that was a real accounting department that would keep track of money like the business in. There's no business plan. There's no policies and procedures. It's really they're just flying by the seat of their pants. Who y'all waiting on? Shug? Yeah. Everybody waiting on Shug today? I'm waiting on him, too. That's right. I don't know what time he's due up here. Probably a little bit later. If Shug said 10 AM was the meeting, you won't see him until about 7 PM. <laughs> 8 o'clock, kick him Shug like he's on time for the meeting. <laughs> Shug was never by himself. He always had. I'd say three to five guys with him. Suge asked me to bring in all the bloods, how many of I can get. We started recruiting guys from the neighborhood, the mob fire rules. It was just a blood nation. Suge Knight knew he could pay them to be his security and basically carry out any type of extortion or, or, or assaults that he wanted done and spread fear to uh, persons that he wanted to intimidate. There was a phone put in at that throw at that time, and that phone was strictly for Harry O. If that phone rings, nobody answers it. It's only for Suge to answer. Death Row Chronicles, three vacant, take one, Mark. Pictures up. One day, Suge comes into the studio, and one of the Stanley brothers is on the phone, and he says, who are you? He says, oh, I'm, I'm here and, you know, to see Dre. I'm a friend of Dre's. He said, well, I don't give a f who you are. Hang up the phone. Their response to him is, F you. You're not Dr. Dre. This ain't your shit. Make him have to escalate the goal. OK. Now I got to show y'all who I am. Suge comes back with his gun, puts the gun to the guy's head. He said, mother I told you to hang up the phone. I hang up the phone. He gets mad. He turns from zero to 100 real quick. Dre's in the big old studio working on tracks. Suge says, take off all your clothes. He says, man, I'm not taking off my clothes. So Suge shoots a bullet by his ear. Anytime it was some aggressive, it was definitely for a reason. The Stanley Brothers, they was talking to everybody at the studio. I had to show those guys how to respect people. Suge says, you know, I could really f you up, but I'm not gonna do that. But I got your driver's license, and if you tell anybody about what happened, then it's gonna be your ass, it's gonna be your mama's ass, I'm gonna get your family. Guy puts on his clothes, goes downstairs, walks over to Hollywood Boulevard, 
stops a cop car and says, I just got assaulted in this building. That began all of Suge's criminal problems. <laughs> 